Hey! It's June 26, 2013, and you're listening to another episode of Bites Over It's Chicago's favorite tech morning show. With me in the studio as always is one Miss Hever Brown. Well, hello everyone. One Mr. Brett Mackey. Soggy boots and all. And everyone's favorite nemesis, Dave Seidler. I used Heather's broken umbrella this morning. Didn't work. So uh, stressed out. I'm John Osler. <laughs> I'm John Osler. Oh man, did we have a good time at the Moxie yeah, last week? Oh Hi, man. Jeez. Jeez. The pictures just were released on Built in Chicago's Facebook. There's the video of Moog doing the moonwalk was just released on NBC5. You know, Ooh. people do not appreciate the things we do for this city. I tell you, you got to bring out everybody's natural talent. That's we, true. We do. That's true. You I, know, you know, we used the smoke machine to uh, present Moog, and Maria Catris didn't know we were going to use it. She came running backstage <laughs> saying something was on fire. That's amazing. <laughs> Freaking out. Aww. She's, she probably had a pretty stressful night with yeah. us she out did. there. We, we messed with her. Sorry, <laughs> Maria. Awesome. <laughs> you got to bring the production to the next level. That's true. We That's look true. good, though. Yeah. Oh, for sure. Oh, sure. Uh, yeah. Maggie but had a, a lot of great photos. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. he did. He did. You, you could be on the cover of a lot of different magazines. This, a lot this of different. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's taking over the world. Effectively. Oh, Let's, yeah. think. Let's think of what those can be. Uh, oh, magazine. <laughs> G- GQ. You want to go over that high? I'll do GQ. Yeah. Fine. All right. Bowtie. The Bowtie Magazine. Is there one? Because we should make one. Mm-hmm. There should be one. Brett should start one. We have so much show. We're, we're interviewing Nick today. Uh, Nick Rosa from Sandbox Industries. This guy's just a badass. If, you, if your name is Matt Moog or Troy Hennikoff, you need to learn from Nick. Seriously, he's been all the way around the block you were on while running, not on a bike. Uh, uh, ooh. Oh, man. So good quotes too. I, I really love this interview. So you guys stick around for this. Not to mention, this is our last Chicago Tech startup madness pitch. It's yes. true. So, Exciting. Anyway. Gonna be a winner soon. Yeah. Uh. Anyway, tons of show. Let's get to it. The title of today's episode is Mr. Sandman. Today's bagels are brought to you by NYC Bagel Deli and Catering. Head on over there, get your kettle baked goodness today. Yeah, they're good. And if you are thirsty, you might want to head over to Botrust. Check them out at Botrust.com. Say hi to Phil and Seth. Mm. It's now time of the show we call Chicago Tech Startup Madness. Hey, Woo-hoo! everybody. Yeah. We're, it's in the final round. Final round, Woo! baby. Is well, near. Well, kind of. Yeah? Kind of. Kind of. It's a big day for some startup in the future. It's the last four of 32 first-round startups. We've already got people moving on. If you go to bitesorbagels.com, you can check out who's moving on. Mystery Tackle Box is one of them. That's true. They got a lot of tweets. Yeah. Holy crap. It's a cool company. Taking it down. You guys mm. better bring up your game. So... Let's get on with it. Brett. Oh, we're ready. Who are you Mr. representing? Brady. I'm hungry this week for Dishable.com. Dishable is a web app that lets you leverage the power of Facebook and your friends to find and share the best restaurants in town, basically. So, um, you know, of course, you get to build a profile restaurants that you've been to and rate them. And of course, You get suggestions based on your profile, but Dishable lets you dig into your annoyingly foodie friends profiles to find that undiscovered gem without actually having to call them and get the 40-minute lowdown on how to pair the pinot with the faux gras at True. (laughs) (laughs) Or to plate it a different way. (laughs) It's like this, ya techaroos. You're sitting with your wife, partner, husband, or that lunchtime leech dart Branson in marketing. And all your stomachs are whining like Justin Bieber's capuchin monkey Mally sitting in a cell at the German airport custom office. 
Don't act like you don't know the story, Dave. So what to do, where to go to feed that noisy little primate in your pooch? Well, if you're like most indecisive eaters, when you ask where to eat, you play the I don't know game, or maybe you more of a I don't care, or maybe just a blank starer, neither of which get you eating charcuterie or Chinese chicken anytime soon. Quite the opposite, my friends. And oh, Mary Jo, who's that crouching in the corner of your dining room, chewing the arm off her Barbie doll? Your darling little daughter, Deborah, who's 10 seconds from calling DCFS. If you don't get your ass in gear and make up your mind already. Okay, okay, you say, and in order to save Barbie from becoming a four-limb amputee, you settle on that same old tie tenement up the block for yet another round of poo nang curry. <laughs> or you can let dishables.com take over. It's the web app that acts as your belly's brain. Or more so, or, or more so, it brings you the belly brains of a million fans and friends on Facebook who have dished and wished on the thousands of restaurants you probably want to eat at if you just stop saying I don't care. I know we've all been here before, folks, many, many, many times. So I'm calling on all of you to end the hunger and vote up this little dish at dishable underscore shy. End the hunger, people. Holy oh, crap. Another amazing <gasps> pitch that I've read. I wait, nice. I wait every week for can him I just to... Say, can I just say, very nice work on all your Brett, you do oh, good. Hey, you do a good you job, do Brett. Good. You do a good job. He's not paid people anymore to do it that way. It's, it's true. He I'm just work that does into it. The second round. But man, if you are interested it. in getting your startup pitch, all right, Brett. <laughs> Dave, who do you got? <laughs> yeah, we're trying to pimp him out. Feeling yeah. good. <laughs> I will pimp Brett out. Let me out of the cage. He's oh, done geez. it to me once so before. Old. Long story. We won't go into. Very it. long story. Right, what you got, Dave? <laughs> all right, all right, all right. There's a lot of uh, education-based training programs, uh, especially in the tech community, coming out these days. You got uh, Mobile Makers. You got Starterly. You got Dev Bootcamp. I came across a really awesome one called Experience Institute, and this is uh, pretty different, actually, than, than everything else that is out there. Victor Saad um, created this startup to literally get people inside of companies to learn directly from the source. So instead of going through a classroom experience, his goal is to get people inside companies, pair them with mentors, and have them learn on the job um, that way. So basically, it's a 12-month uh, program where you pick uh, six different companies to pair up with, uh, conferences to go to, and mentors to speak with. And at the end of it, you document everything and you present all your learnings, um, and hopefully you get a job out of it by all of these awesome people that you've met with. So. It's uh, $10,000, pretty affordable for 12-month uh, program. Uh, applications, you've got to get them in now because the first class application deadline ends July 15th. So just a really, just a really unique way to learn. Um, he's pitching it as a, um, or I guess for people who are either interested in taking a year off of school or looking to switch careers or uh, are thinking about getting an MBA or going to grad school, but want to try something unique and uh, really tap into uh, taking a risk and, and learning something. So he did this originally with a thing called uh, the Leap Year Project, where he literally went around the world um, being an apprentice at all of these different places, in uh, clothes maker in India. He went to a uh, architect in... <laughs> Uh, Colorado. He worked out of the dojo office. He was making coffee at Botrus and um, doing all this crazy stuff. So check out their website, expinstitute.com. They're paired up with awesome companies. Um, they're paired up with awesome uh, mentors. Really, really like what this guy is doing. At EXP Institute. Check it out. Very nice. Anybody notice how Dave brings up Dojo and Botrus and almost he every likes him show? some Phil and Seth. He's got a huge crush on for those sure. Dudes. Oh, oh what? It's wild. It's true though. Every episode. Yeah. All right, Heather, what you got? Oh man, cutting it off. All right, today, folks, <laughs> I'm representing <laughs> Raise Five. They're a uh, they're a platform for freelance fundraisers who are trying to make a difference in their community. So basically. Um, I can go on and I can and donate my services, donate my goods, and I can create a, 
a campaign and I post it online. So let's say I want to give some tap dancing lessons to Ooh, you, Mr. Mackey, and I you can sign some. up for those tap dancing lessons. Um, you would donate whatever I charge. So let's say that's $5, $10, 150 obviously is what I would charge. I would give you a tap dance lesson. You would donate the money, and then I get to choose the charity that I want that money to go to. So it's kind of cool. It's like all that money from the service, from that good that you purchase, would go to this um, whatever nonprofit that you choose. So it's a really cool, really cool thing they're doing. So check them out, raise5.com, and vote them up. Raise at raise underscore five. Honorable, honorable. It's very cool. Speaking yeah. Speaking of tap dancing, remember when you two tap danced on stage at the Moxies? Ooh, John. I think I remember something about that. I know. Yeah. yeah. It was a wonderful moment. How much did you charge John? Bites over Bagel's history. Lesson. Oh yeah, you got to get lessons from me in tap dancing. <laughs> For sure. Awkward. Okay, yeah, here you we guys. Go. <laughs> I am representing a startup in town called Project Travel. Project. Travel. Another travel company? Hold on. Website? What Hold we on. Got? Project Travel wants... Did, did anyone do study abroad? Anyone in here? I wish I did. I studied a couple abroad. You wish. See? Ah! Whoa, anyway. Man. Your wife... I'm does, married. I'm your married. wife does not listen to this I show. Know. I don't know why. No? None of you did? Oh, see, now this is, this is a great use case. You guys... Wait, what was the question? Did you... I got distracted by... Did you by, do uh, study Mikey's. abroad? I did not. Okay, so we're, we're we all, all suck. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but did we want to do study abroad? Oh, for Absolutely. sure. Now imagine you've got a niece or a nephew, or maybe later in life, it's a child oh. who wishes to do study abroad. David's stressed out. He doesn't but, want to send. But them you don't have enough money to, to send them out, right? Right? Mm -mm. You, you probably don't, because you, you're trying to make your living doing bites over bagels. So that's not going to work out for you. Number one. But number two, grandparents. Or anyone in the family, like aunts and uncles, cool aunts and uncles, who are like, oh, yeah, you've got to go to Germany or wherever. They'll, they'll get on board. If you tell them, I want to go study abroad, they would help you out, right, generally speaking. Mm -hmm. if you're, yeah. Yeah, and probably. so uh, Jennifer Thomas says, aha, I know what to do. So she's created a site mm -hmm. with now a, a pretty large group of people um, to allow you to set up a fundraising page for your study abroad type activities. Now, it doesn't have Ooh. to be specifically study abroad, but that's a great use case. It could be a high school exchange or something like that. They have an application process. So this isn't for like, I want to go to Panama City. You guys need to help me go. No, mm -mm. you will be rejected. But if you have a legitimate abroad experience, you can apply. A little application for your project page. They'll approve it. And then you can share this link out on your Facebook and mm -hmm. send it to your aunts and uncles and send it to your grandparents and your parents and their friends and say, I want to go somewhere. And as a result, these people can go in, use their credit card, and contribute a little bit to this fund. And the nice thing is, it's not like Kickstarter where you're like, I must raise $10,000. That'd be one hell of a vacation, though. Yeah. Trip, trip, trip. Not a vacation. Come on, guys. Uh, you, already, you already failed the first, yeah, first yeah, test. But the, um, the nice thing is, is once you reach 15% of your goal, those funds get transferred to you. So what's nice is, think about this. You're having a birthday coming up. You don't want gifts. You want to go on this trip. It's like, you know how my parents are like, I don't know what to get you. You have weird tastes. That was my mom. Sorry, mom. You were awkward. Yeah, you were really weird. Yeah. yeah. Instead, be like, hey, contribute to my page, right? It's brilliant. Mm -hmm. And then they feel good because they're like, oh, I'm giving you an experience you'll never forget. And you won't end up like us where we've really never seen anything. Well, okay, we've seen some stuff, but not in college when we should have. That's true. And if you so, can't get your parents to do it, John's parents are happy to donate to their page. That's true. That's true. So here's what I'll say, y'all, is that uh, there's no question that Project Travel is going to win this round. So go vote them up. Okay. Mm -hmm. John, why are, they, agreed. why are the top of your shoulders sweating? <laughs> it's from the rain. I know. It's My jacket oh, is man, out. This day of rain. Opposite. Opposite. Reverse pit. Yeah, Take you're pitting down. out on the top of your shoulders <laughs> yeah. right now. It was rainy today, huh? It was. Yeah. Dave lost his coffee, went down the river. <laughs> Chuck Templeton's going to collect the plastic that you littered. It's a great day. You guys are trying to make people forget about what I just pitched. Okay, so that Feel concludes good. the final <laughs> week of round one. It's over, guys. It's over. Don't right. email Good us job. asking to be pitched Good anymore. Job. Okay, how do you vote? Go to bitesforbagels.com. Mm -hmm. Click on the vote link next to the startup you want to win that round. And you'll see that there are some that already, there's already startups who probably want to close their doors now because they did not win their round. So don't let this happen to your favorite startup, everyone. Don't yeah, let we've it. got a couple death threats coming. Yeah. Way. So uh, voting 
through our site. You can also just go to Twitter and use the hashtag Chicago Tech Start Up Madness. So you can just write whatever you want. You could also just write whatever you want when you hit vote because it just composes a tweet for you, but that's fine. So that's the voting. Go on in. Do it. Two let's, weeks. Let's get one of these startups to move on. And the winner is going to get a sweet prize pack and featured interview on the show. Sweet. Oh. All right. Feeling good, everybody? Yes, yes. I do. Yeah, feeling good. The end. Let's go. Today's featured interview is with Nick Rosa. He is the founder and managing director of... Sandbox Industries. Ooh, welcome. Welcome to the show. Thank you. So, we always start these shows off by asking questions like, what is Sandbox Industries? I knew you'd start with a tough one. Yeah. <laughs> How many times have you answered this? <laughs> I get asked it a lot. It's really hard to figure out what Sandbox Industries is because we take advantage of opportunities. And uh, we start companies, we invest in companies, and we start accelerator programs. So we have a mix of all three. Very cool. So this isn't a plastic sandbox toy no, company. And there isn't even a sandbox in our office. So we've got to oh, fix man. that. Got to a fix lot it. of plastic shovels, though. You know yeah. It's... yeah, there was, but I don't know where it went. <laughs> oh. I, think, I think a cat found it. Oh, man, cats. It would be great if the, all of the hallways were just filled with sand. At the office. That yeah, would be that great. Would be shoes yeah. off policy? Right, yeah, shoes off. That'd be nice. That's the winter office in Maui. Oh, well. Is everyone invited to the, to the office in Maui? Yeah, can you tell Not us everybody. about... No. <laughs> let's get the, let's get the Maui part in. Let's get that going right now. Yeah, so tell us every time I actually uh, talk to your colleagues, they say you're in Maui. What's the deal? Well, I try to do that for the winter, but um, this year I failed. I came back in March. Oh. <laughs> the worst year to do it, too. Yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah. That's pretty sweet. Yeah, I get away. We should have done the show from there. <laughs> it would be more fun. Yeah. We'll do a follow-up. We'll do a follow-up. <laughs> <laughs> so can you break down the, the company a little bit more into uh, some of the different uh, accelerators that you guys have in-house? In sure. Yeah? Sure. Well, we, ha we, we, uh, we worked with Troy Hennikoff and Sam Yegan and started Accelerate, which is now Techstars Chicago. And uh, from that, uh, we went to Healthbox. So we said we know something about accelerators and starting them, and we know something about healthcare because we run a big healthcare fund. And, uh, and we wanted to put those two together, and we're finding great success. We're, this year we're going to run six programs. Last year we ran three, Chicago, Boston, and London. Um, and uh, I think there's a couple more on the horizon. One of them is sort of secret. Ooh, uh, so you can we'll you can talk about it. Here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Nobody's listening. Nobody's listening. <laughs> uh, but we're, but I think vertical accelerators make a lot of sense, and they make a lot of sense because I spend a lot of time in the corporate world. Corporations are trying to figure out how to innovate, and they really are having a hard time with it. Entrepreneurs know how to innovate, and uh, they're having a hard time connecting with the strategics who ultimately could buy them or use their services. And accelerators are a great way to expose, you know, ten or. 15 or 20 or seven companies to corporates and help them develop the business along the way, as opposed to this mm -hmm. random act which occurs today uh, of trying to find each other. Sure. Yeah. Cool. So the um, the healthcare fund, or I guess is it considered a it's healthcare? A fund. It's, it's a, a fund, healthcare right? venture fund. With uh, it's with Blue Cross. Yeah. Yeah. So that I mean that that vertical is going to be pretty huge coming up, right? I mean, there's healthcare is huge. Massive. Healthcare is huge. Yeah. Yeah. Is it? And we it, focus on healthcare IT okay. and enabling services for our accelerators. But we get a little bit of everything. We have some diagnostics. We have some people with a a, a new desktop genetic manufacturing product. Mm -hmm. So we dabble in a little bit of everything. So tell us about um, what you did before Sandbox, and how did you get to this point? We don't have enough time, but I will. Ooh, <laughs> the short version. Yeah. Cliff notes. Cliff notes. Uh, no, not, not that I did anything. <laughs> Great. Um, Here's a Maui. I, I, was, I was in the corporate world, so I worked at Searle Pharmaceuticals, and then that turned into NutraSuite, um, a job for me at NutraSuite, and then Monsanto bought that entity, and so I worked for Monsanto. I then took NutraSuite private, and... Uh, sold that. So about 10 years ago, I was uh, about in retirement mode. And then I started Sandbox with my colleague, Bob Shapiro. Cool. What, drew, what drew you out at that point? What was the... Out of retirement? Yeah. <laughs> Boredom. Boredom. I, I, uh -huh. I really don't like anything else as much as work and creating new businesses. So I tried golfing. Yeah. Um, that that's go? only fun when you have a job. 
<laughs> it's something to get away from. Yeah, right. right. Yeah. yeah, that makes sense. Uh, so how, does, how did Chicago play into kind of the building of uh, sandbox industries? Well, it was home, mm-hmm. and, uh, and, I, and we felt there was just a, an opportunity for us to try a new way of starting businesses. So we, had a, we researched it for a little while, and we said if there's some common mistakes that both corporations make and entrepreneurs make in starting new businesses, and we wanted to try and uh, look past those frailties of the current models, and it still happens. And the basis for our differentiation is that we try to ask the killer questions really early. So if we're going to fail, which we probably are in new business endeavors, um, we want to fail fast, we want to learn from it, and we want to ask those killer questions early. So many entrepreneurs avoid the question that you want to ask early. It's the question, the question is, if your business fails, why will it fail? And, uh, and so often people don't ask that. They, a- they answer the easy ones. Can I get a great website? Can I mm-hmm. get some users? Um, but often there's a, a really killer question behind all those. So we try to ask those, and therefore we kill a lot of businesses. Mm-hmm. How, how quickly are you killing businesses? Is there like a, <clears throat> like a, a really short period where you're like, ah, that's not going to work? Yeah, there's some, there's some gut feel. Yeah. So you use that a lot. What's the fastest um, you killed? <laughs> <laughs> of course. <laughs> One hour. <laughs> we sort of kill it. We, we call the new business ideas our goldfish. Because, uh, you know, it's sort of like they're not our pets yet. They're our goldfish. So if something goes wrong, uh, they go right. down the toilet. So we yeah. used to have all our oh. ideas as goldfish. No emotional connection. Once they hit it's another goldfish. point where they're, they become a mammal, uh, <laughs> wow. we, we watch them It's harder to drown them. Yeah, you can, yeah. Always, you can always trick your kid to thinking the fish is still alive and going down the toilet. Like, yeah, right. to a better place. <laughs> right. That's right. Yeah. One day that yeah. will come back to bite you, that comment right there. That's yeah. for the record. I've done it once. Uh-huh. <laughs> it worked. It worked well. <laughs> Yeah. So how has Sandbox changed in its business model? At one point, not that long ago, you were bringing on uh, new entrepreneurs and accelerating them, and now has it changed from that model? Um, you know, it changes all the time. Uh, the, Bob and I started the company with the basic philosophy that we're going to hire a lot of smart people and let them do things in the Sandbox. And so, therefore, it changes all the time. And we do hire great people um, and every time I look around, I'm reminded of the Gandhi quote, which says, I am their leader, which way have they gone? So we're changing all the time. We're starting new things. Uh, and today our model is, uh, we're, like we talked about, we're really keen on accelerator models because they offer a really good bridge between the corporates and the entrepreneurs. But we also have just closed a food and agriculture fund. So now we manage $450 million of capital. Well, um, that kind of came out of nowhere for us. Um, it, yeah, that's nice. It's nice. Yeah. <laughs> Not a thin air. <laughs> yeah, so talking about more of that homegrown stuff, like how, what is the process? Like everybody is just running around like, I got this idea, I got this idea. Like how does that work? What's Trying the, to get the cats the out of the office. creative process. Like there. that's so cool. Yeah, well, there's a lot of, you know, when you <laughs> get that to, too, John, sorry. <laughs> there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot too being in a mindset of creating businesses. Right. So you look at things differently. You read the paper differently. You look at your television. You listen to the radio differently. And, um, ideas come up. So we have a lot of impromptu brainstorming sessions. We have some that we organize a little more, but every once in a while, something like we have Marbles the Brain Store is mm-hmm. one of our businesses right. that's pretty successful. And that was an idea on the whiteboard. It was, let's create a brain gym mm-hmm. for people to go to to exercise their brain. And we quickly pivoted that one to a kiosk. And then we started a kiosk in Woodfield Mall, and that one failed. And then in October 2008, we did something which no one who knew anything about retail would do, which is we opened a store um, on Grand Avenue. And if you remember October 2008, it was absolutely the worst time to do that. And it was wildly successful for the holiday season. So we sort of like things that we don't know a lot about sometimes, mm-hmm. because if you don't know a lot about it, you don't know why it won't work. Sure. And um, therefore, like you, you can That's succeed. Cool. So you have all these ideas, and I know you said you, you kill some of them off, but how do they get from that process of someone has an idea, you do whiteboards and stuff, to the process of killing them off? Yeah. We, um, and you don't do a lot of research, so kind of how, do you, how right. do you get to that point? Well, we do a little bit of research once it gets to a place where we say it's a one-pager, mm-hmm. and that means somebody's devoted enough time to write a one-page analysis and see what the competition is and get the basic thrust of the idea. From that, we look at what's the killer question. And then if the killer question is too expensive to find the answer to, that's a kill. Got it. 
So if it says, well, we could find the answer to this, but it'll cost us $500,000, we don't really want to do that. Um, so that's one threshold. And mm -hmm. then if you say, here's a killer question, we can test that pretty cheaply with $100,000 or $200,000, which is most ideas today, because technology is making things so easy mm -hmm. uh, that that's not really the gating factor anymore, um, then, we, and then that's really becomes a little bit of a popularity contest. Um, and uh, it's, are enough people excited about it to move it forward to the next step, which would be an intensive assessment and then a business plan. Gotcha. And, and we do some market research as well. We, de we actually have a startup business, which is called Lab 42, mm -hmm. which we developed because we needed cheap, fast market research. And so they do that for us. Yeah, it's a great they company. They do that for other people too. Really so, cool. Yeah. What about the, the company culture right now? Uh, could you talk about it? I mean, I, I've heard both sides of the coin where you've got 37 Signals who has library rules, and then you've got maybe 8-Bit Studios who has, like, chaos rules. Like, what is, yeah. what is the... I think it's organized chaos, but, uh, you know, we place a lot of emphasis on metric, metrics, but we also want people to have fun, and we want people to be flexible. So I'd say our culture is pretty flexible, and uh, let people sort of march to their own beat, but tell us what your metrics are, tell us what goals you're trying to achieve, and we don't care a whole lot where you achieve them and uh, whether you work at home or work at the office or work in small groups. So we have a loose culture from that perspective, but we are pretty rigorous on metrics. So what's the future of Sandbox? What do you see in the next couple of years? So a few of us are talking about having a Sandbox in every village. Mm. And the idea is that sand, there's no reason that the culture of Sandbox can't pervade other places. So we're in London now. We're in San Francisco, as we talked about. We also, through Healthbox, have an office in Boston. Um, I think we're going to, through the Healthbox program, we're going to be doing something in Africa, the Middle East, Istanbul, and Asia. Cool. So we think this is just going to spread. That's we're awesome. going to figure it like out. A lot of, like, is it more cause-driven at that point? Um, no, it's still, what we're starting with is healthcare. Got it. But our ag fund, our food and ag fund is going to take us to international areas. Got it. So the basic philosophy, I think, will be global in, in a bigger sense in five to ten years. Very cool. Yeah. Exciting. What about your legacy? What are you trying to do over there? You know, I'm trying to create a place where a lot of people can realize what they want to do. Um, I've had a great career in the corporate world. This has been a great nine or ten years in this world. So I'd like to create the environment where people can come, create something for themselves, get rich along the way would be nice. So we'd like to create a lot of millionaires out of our entrepreneurs. Um, that would be good. It sounds like everything has been smooth sailing. You know, you got you sold NutraSuite. You did. What was the hardest thing you've had to do, and how did you overcome that? And and did you almost quit doing something because of that? Or a lot of people listening are entrepreneurs and trying to get through some barriers or hard, hard times. So any advice sure. would be great. Sure. Um, let's see. So I think the first thing is you can't get too worried about getting fired. Um, I never was too worried about being fired. I always, I think I saw this slogan somewhere. If not, I should put it on a t-shirt, which is <laughs> I was born with nothing and I have most of it left. Um, that's sort of the attitude you have to take, <laughs> sure. because if you take the attitude, I'm going to get rich on this business, then you're going to probably make bad decisions. So you have to be willing to, to take a risk, to get fired, to go broke. Um, and if you're not, then you shouldn't be an entrepreneur if you don't have that attitude. So um, I've had that a few times. I tried to get fired a few times. It, it, it only worked once or twice. <laughs> <laughs> What time okay. is your bedtime? Yeah. Oh, very early. Like, I'm asleep by 10. And you get up at what time? Like 4, 5. Yeah. Yes. We've noticed yeah, everybody's like, classic, all though. successful people get up at like, you know, really? 3. Well, not 3, but yeah. extremely early. Yeah. So. Uh, Matt Moog, We're all like, you're, you're on the Matt Moog, just you're on the Matt Moog plan. He yeah. goes to bed at 10, up at 4.30 or right. 5. Yeah. Every day. That's me. Yeah. Do you hold that over your team's heads that you've Sometimes. been up for two hours working yeah. on their projects without them yeah. awake? You're like... I he do. I've been up since. Day, I send a lot of emails. <laughs> do you? At four or five in the oh, morning. Yes, that's man. awesome. How many of the total ideas do you guys get to hear? Like you and Bob. Mm. Well, Bob is in a semi-retired state. Okay. Who is so Bob? He Bob he's Shapiro. A, he's, he's Cali. I know, yeah. I know. Come on. Yeah. Yeah. We got to get Bob in here also. Yeah. <laughs> Bob would be good. He's, he's, a, he's a smart guy. This is one of the smartest nice. guys I've ever known. Um, how many ideas do I see? Yeah. I, I kind of see... Probably five or six hundred a year. Okay. Yeah. You know, oh man. How many total would you say if you could if you could guesstimate that are out there that we create? Yeah. Well, that probably like maybe double that. Okay. A thousand. 
We, That's cool. We, it, you know, to get one business is mm -hmm. probably 500 to 1,000 ideas. It's awesome. Yeah. You know, just your day-to-day... Are you are you meeting with entrepreneurs on a daily basis, or you kind of you kind of mentioned you just let them run, right? And yeah, I, I I do so many different things that it overwhelms me sometimes. So sure. I have I have a really fun job that I yesterday morning I was meeting with the president of a large multinational pharmaceutical company. Uh, in the afternoon, I was meeting with an entrepreneur who's just a single founder trying to start a business. So I love you know across that gamut of uh, large corporates small entrepreneurs, that's sort of the sweet spot for me. I think that's actually the sweet spot for Chicago entrepreneurs too. Um, so much talk is about um, why, what, why are we not like Silicon Valley or not, not like New York and what's different. Chicago has so many corporates here mm -hmm. and so many strate important strategics that entrepreneurs can take advantage of that. We're, we're way ahead of um, either coast in that regard. So if we can just get entrepreneurs and corporates to talk to each other, you know, it's great if you go to 1871 and you look mm -hmm. around and there's that great pit and it's got glass walls mm -hmm. and I love 1871. Um, but you can always tell the suits that are occasionally walking around there and looking in. It's like they're looking at the polar bears at Lincoln Park Zoo. <laughs> yes, and they don't have a way to interact with each other. And if we could only get them to talk to each other, it would be a lot better. they got to start wearing, you know, shorts. Just and... throw them in a sandbox. Yeah, right. I don't know, right. Just... Yeah. So, I, so I think that's a big thing for us in Chicago and I think that's a big thing for us at Sandbox bridging that gap. I, I think there's a lot of uh, fertile ground there for creativity, sure. innovation, for taking some of the really cool tech ideas that, um, quite honestly, the younger generation has. You know, it's great that people can go find a 50 cent beer and find out the proportion of men and women in a bar or a club at night. But if we can start applying those things to healthcare and those technologies to mm -hmm. agriculture, um, in solving some serious problems around the world. The fun is great, but I think those technologies are going to be useful in other areas, and that's pretty cool. Do you know why we haven't, um, like Silicon Valley, been able to uh, build anything like an Instagram or Facebook or anything social like that here? This seems to be more like transactional-based, yeah, uh, which is a good thing, I think. But you it, thoughts it on is that? a good thing. It's a different thing. You know, we're not... We're not great risk takers in the venture capital community here in Chicago. They are in Silicon Valley. You know, they'll take a risk and they'll say, oh, make money. We don't have to worry about that for a long, 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 long time. Mm -hmm. um, here in Chicago, it's sort of, okay, we don't have to worry about making money next year, but how are you going to make it the next year? And so we're more practical about our ideas here and sure. what we invest behind, and that's okay. There's a place for that. And that, again, dovetails with that's much more appealing to the corporations that we could service here in Chicago than it is to create an Instagram. It's now time for the most important question of the interview. <laughs> okay. What is your favorite bagel and how do you like it prepared? Poppy seed toasted. Mm. Oh, nice, classy. Yeah. Just dry. No okay. cream cheese? Butter. Oh, we haven't had a butter Smart. yet. Yeah. yeah, we did. We had, uh, I can't believe it's not butter. Oh yeah, That's not what was butter. that? That's not butter. Forgot. Not Anthony. There's nothing like real butter. Is it Maria? I like real butter. Real butter. Toasted bacon. From where? Any from the Midwest, bacon. damn it. Yeah, from the Midwest. <laughs> what's, that, what, what's that place on uh, uh, North Avenue and Sheffield? Our sponsor. No NYC New York City Bagel City Deli. Bagel Deli, Deli and yeah. Catering. Oh, wow. How about that? Okay. Get some kettle baked goodness today. <laughs> yeah. That's there you the go. best. We, That's they the sponsor best. us every week. So. Oh, good. Good yeah, call. We get, yeah. We get bagels over there. Right. Yeah. Well played. He did his research. Yeah, he did. Yeah, I, yeah, I knew that was fake. Kate that told was me. Fake. Subtle, wasn't it? Subtle. <laughs> she <laughs> she prepped me. <laughs> Two cards. It is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, where should our listeners find out more? Do you want, first of all, do you want 1,000 emails? Number two, where should listeners find out more about what you guys are doing at Sandbox? Um, I don't think I want 1,000 emails, but, you know, we'll see. Whatever happens, happens. I, I, I'm good at filtering. Uh, uh, you know, our website, www.sandboxindustries.com. Yeah. Well, Nick, thanks for coming right, in thanks. and it was taking fun. some time out. This was fun. Cool. You guys are great. Best of luck. Awesome. All right, thanks. Thanks. <laughs> Wrapping your face off this week is Katie Got Bands. She's a 18-year-old uh, rapping sensation. She just released a killer mixtape. Check it out. She's on Twitter at Katie Got Bands or BitesOverBagels.com. And that concludes episode 19 of <laughs> Bites Over Bagels.
Join us on the show next week where we'll have Jake Nickel, founder and CEO of Threadless. You guys heard of that place? Never I, heard of it. No, didn't think so. Dip, dip, dip. Heather, where should people go to find out more about Bites Over Bagels? Well, what a great question. You can go to BitesOverBagels.com. We're on the Twitters, the Facebooks, and the iTunes. So check us out. Yeah, you might want to check out Instagram. We have made a switch to Instagram for all of our videos as well. So uh, I just don't agree with this, but that's fine. Yeah, we're we're boycotting uh, Vine. Vine. I, I still like Vine. I think six seconds is the right amount. Well, then just do six seconds. Yeah, you can just do six seconds on Instagram. And I'll put a little... Okay. Anyway, thanks for tuning in, everybody. Well, see you next week. Band up on my tree jeans. These fucks, I say no anything. Them 30s blow, one of him sing. Shots slow him down like he out the lane.